Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and today I'm here with Maciej Voital. So, Maciej, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Hi, Steve. It's great to be here. Thank you. So, we're very excited to speak with you here today and talk about investing in frontier markets and specifically about Iran. And here on the show, we are big followers of Warren Buffett. Uh, I don't necessarily think Warren Buffett would invest you around. That's not so much what I'm saying, but he's very famous for saying that there's no difficulty bonus in investing. And I thought of this exact quote going into this interview because I heard you comparing investing in Iran with what happened in Poland and China whenever the markets open up. So it's not so much a question of finding the best stocks. So obviously, we always want to find the best stocks, but being in the markets whenever that happens. Um, so perhaps for our, for our listeners, could you talk about uh, what does a market open up mean? Um, say if you use Poland or China as examples. Uh, yes. So look, market opening up can mean obviously many different things, and it will be different. But if we look at uh, you know the last twenty years of history and those main markets, the main thing it meant is that there was an inflow of foreign capital and usually not enough liquidity in the stock market to absorb it, which meant that the local market was just moving you know, rapidly higher in a very short period of time. So, for example, in the early 90s, um, China opened up also not fully partially, and the index uh, in dollar terms went up around 12 times in, in less than two years. Uh, well, it's interesting to note that at that time, uh, China was actually still under sanctions uh, after um, Tiananmen Square. Um, so it wasn't very easy and, and it wasn't very straightforward. Still, um, when it opened up and there were no um, foreign investors involved, when they came, the market just skyrocketed. Uh, with Russia, it was similar. I mean, the, the index in dollar terms in, uh, I think it was 1994, went up around 10 times, again, in less than two years. Poland was, you know, Poland was all even more striking because the stock market was launched around 1992, 1993. For the first two years, nothing really happened. Uh, the stocks were trading at three times earnings. No one was investing. There were no foreigners. Um, then foreign investors saw, okay, it's actually, you know, a stable enough economy after transitioning, you know, from socialism to, to, to the market economy, um, it's stable enough. And they started investing and um, the market went up in dollar terms almost 25 times, 25 X in less than two years. Then it crashed, obviously, then it went up again, right? But at the beginning, it was just moving sideways at very low valuations. And then there was this sudden inflow of uh, foreign capital that just lifted the market, um, you know, big time. So Iran um, is similar in many ways. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so what you refer to this, this Warren Buffett quote is actually makes sense in those markets, right? Because you just want to be long, right? You just want to be long the stock market. Your investment strategy doesn't have to be complicated. It probably shouldn't be complicated, right? You don't have to go into, I don't know, derivatives. Well, at those stages in those markets, um, you know, derivatives market are, markets are probably not de well developed anyway. So you just have to be long, right? Um, long beta, and that's it, and you'll be happy. Um, but what what he also said, I think it was you know part of the same the same quote that. Um, the execution of this investment strategy is important. And in those markets, execution means actually getting this exposure, being able to invest early before all this happens, before all the um, all other investors access the market. Um, and it's the same in Iran. Right now, Iran... Um, ah, sorry, one more thing is important. Not all markets, um, when they open up, not all markets have um, well-developed capital markets. China had, had a stock market, Russia had a stock market, Poland had a small stock market. Um, but, you know, they are, there are countries out there that where, you know, North Korea will open up at some point, right? It might be interesting, but there is no capital market. So you can, you know, 
launch a startup or uh, set up a bank, right, or buy a factory there, those type of opportunities, but nothing to do for a portfolio investor. So Iran is similar, more similar to um, the opportunities like China, Russia, Eastern Europe, um, because it has a well-functioning um, liquid stock market with the lowest valuations in the world, which we can talk about in a moment. Um, and all foreign investors, all the foreign money invested in the market is less than half a percent of the market cap because it's really difficult to access it. And it's not only difficult to access it as in China, Russia, you know, 30 years ago, because it's difficult to open a bank account. It's difficult to uh, get a local license. You need a special trading code for foreigners. There is much more uh, administration around it. Right now, it's just impossible to open a non-resident bank account. So you have to become a resident, which is also, um, you know, not easy and, you know, a lot to do just to invest in the market, right? Um, but also, in case of Iran, you have sanctions. You have U.S. sanctions. And then sanctions, you have to understand sanctions. So you have many different levels of sanctions. You have U.N. sanctions, EU sanctions, U.S. sanctions, the most broad comprehensive ones are the u.s sanctions and they say that u.s investors cannot invest uh, at the moment in iran but everyone else can all the european and asian investors are allowed to invest as long as they don't invest in certain sectors or certain entities or companies controlled by certain entities if they don't want to violate u.s sanctions so this is a big homework to do you actually have to do due diligence on every single investment you do. We hired a uh, Washington-based legal advisor who used to be the advisor of the National Security Council at the White House and before he was at, at um, the State Department to advise us on, on sanctions, to, 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 to advise us on, on our due diligence procedures, to tell us if we can or cannot invest in, in, in you know particular um, industry or, or a company. So, so it's really, it's really a, lot of, yeah. a lot of work to do. Um, now, so these are big obstacles. That's why it's similar. That's why when these obstacles are removed, we do expect waves of foreign investors. Initially, they'll be coming from Europe and Asia. And then to come from US, you will, you will need to have additional uh, you know, sanctions, uh, primary US sanctions removed. But it's... Actually, Iran is much more than just than, than China, Russia, and Poland in the in the early nineties, because because of the same sanctions, the other countries just opened up to the flow of foreign capital. Iran will also open up its economy. So right now, when you look at um, um, Iranian companies, um, you have exporters. For example, petrochemical exporters, most profitable comp uh, petrochemical companies in the world, just like in Saudi Arabia, um, uh, highest margins. Highest margin. But if you are an Iranian exporter and want to sell your products abroad, it's difficult for you to find investors uh, because, because it's Iranian. People know there are sanctions, so they don't know whether they are allowed to buy products from you or not. So you have to entice them by offering discounts. So the selling prices... Um, uh, that you're realizing are much lower than global prices that other companies are realizing. Then, you know, try to get paid if you're an Iranian company. Um, banks don't really work, the connections between Iranian banks and, and foreign banks. Try to get your products insured. Try to, try to arrange uh, logistics, shipping. All of this is very, all of very difficult, which means that you pay much more for it. So it's, you know, additional 5% for transferring money, 2.5% for shipping, you know, a couple of percent for insurance. All this eats into their margins and also decreases their, their volumes. So um, opening up of a country, in the case of Iran, will mean, um, for example, for Iranian exporters, volumes going higher and, and at the same time, margins going higher. So, so, so profits will react very strongly to this. So this is on the company level, but also if you look at the macro level, um, Iran for the last 40 years, pretty much for the last 40 years, has been under you, you know, stronger or lighter, but always some sort of sanctions. Um, the economy of Iran has been um, also not expanding as it could have because of sanctions. Um, 
inflation is higher because of sanctions. So what happens when sanctions are lifted, so when the country opens up, is that um, Iran's so first thing that we will observe is that Iran can export much more, much more oil. And this is very important because suddenly they export, you know, two million barrels per day, um, which means, you know, anywhere between 50 and maybe 80 billion dollars of additional revenue per year for the country. And this solves all the problems. This solves the problem of the budget deficit. So they don't have to print as much money as they are printing, which obviously um, um, impacts inflation. Um, this uh, means that their current account will look better. So Iran is a country that before, before the, 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 the last wave of sanctions, they were running um, a strong surplus in trade balance in current account. Um, and, and this will be the case in the future as well. So with that, uh, the currency stabilizes. When the local currency, which is Iranian real, is not depreciating anymore, the inflation, the prices stabilize. So the inflation is no longer a problem. Before Trump imposed sanctions, inflation was in single digits. It was around eight, nine percent for quite a long time. Then it shot up to 50 percent or 40 percent, whatever, right? Because because of the currency depreciation. Um, so so there is no reason why inflation is not going back to around 10 percent. So when you have stable macroeconomic landscape, stable prices, interest rates will go down, obviously, but also it will be possible for the local companies and local consumers to plan, to plan ahead, to plan, you know, a couple of years down the line, which will support um, investment spending. Um, also, lower rates will mean better access to, to money, to, to financing, and better visibility because of stability will mean that people will be more eager to make long-term investments. Um, then consumers will finally, you know, the biggest um, um, so Iranian population uh, lost on sanctions um, um, in the biggest way, meaning that their spending power got hit the most. Com manuf manufacturers actually did pretty well because they, uh, many of them are, are exporting. So um, when sanctions hit, currency was depreciating, their competitiveness was increasing and they were making a lot of money. But consumers were hit with stable macroeconomy. Also, consumers will start feeling better. So their spending power will increase, the real spending power. Um, so what I wanted to say is that opening up of a country in case of Iran not all, means not only the inflow of money, of direct investments, of portfolio investments from outside of, uh, of Iran um, will mean accessing foreign financing, um, will, uh, but it will also mean, uh, so will, will mean uh, profit growth uh, for, for the local companies, but would, will also mean a massive credit impulse, a massive credit boom, because there is no leverage in the economy at the moment. Um, companies don't have much debt, you know, with high interest rates, there is no debt. There is no obviously hard currency debt zero. Um, also individuals, uh, they're not indebted. So everything will, will happen in the future. So you're before all of these things were, were starting. So that's why, you know, the comparison to China, Russia, Poland is, is good and is interesting because it shows you the, the potential for the, you know, sudden increasing prices. But there is much more to it, much more going on um, in the country, in the macro and on the, on the, on the company, corporate level in Iran when, they, when, the, when the country opens up. It's probably not an understatement to say that uh, some of the worst PR you have here in the, the world that might come from Iran. Um, and even if you don't think about the uh, political situation, um, I think a lot of people would think oil and gas whenever they think Iran. Um, and you know, I was a little surprised whenever I learned that it was only 15% of the GDP. It probably tells you how ignorant I am about Iran. Uh, I thought it was significantly more. Um, so perhaps if you can elaborate a bit more on your 30,000 uh, 30, feet view of Iran as investment opportunity, because there are some interesting things about the demographics, uh, the number of listed companies, a lot to, lot to unpack there for Iran. Absolutely. Uh, look, Iran is completely misunderstood 
because it's been under sanctions, because it's been um, shut down, there are no, uh, not too many foreigners in Iran investing or living, so people just don't know. And Iran, so starting with the very basic facts, is a big country of 84 million people with the median age of around 30 years, uh, with the beautiful demographic profile. Um, and um, it's located um, in, the, in the region between Middle East and Central Asia. Um, so it's very important because Iran benefits from its location because it is, for example, on the way of you know, Chinese um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, a very important country between Europe and Asia. But it's also important because Iran plus all its neighbors, it's more than 500 million people. It's like second Europe. And Iranian companies have very good connections in the region. So they are well placed to export in this region. So the whole market, when you look at Iran for those companies, you know, say, okay, 80 million people, but then many regional exporters export to the market of 500 million people. That's why they can gain enough scale and, you know, for example, sustain uh, through sanctions. But what is very important is um, the quality of people in Iran. So the education level, so tertiary education um, enrollment rates are similar to Europe. Um, Iranians have, you know, 5,000 years of written history and, and, and there is a strong sense um, uh, when, you, when you speak to Iranians that they understand this and that there is this uh, heritage strong culture, heritage, and that education has always been important. So you get very strong quality of people that you can employ and wages are lower than in Vietnam. Um, it's um, as, you know, ratio of cost to quality, probably, you know, the best country in the world. Now, when it comes to um, the, the economy, Indeed, they, they have, Iran has the largest combined oil and gas reserves in the world. Uh, but it, it is only, right now, it's actually le less than 10% of GDP. Um, it used to be 15%. Um, then, because of sanctions, um, now Iran is exporting much less oil. So, um, so it's less than 10% for sure. Um, and the rest of the economy, it's a well-diversified economy. You have a lot of manufacturing. They produce you know, more than a million cars per year. So all the industries related to car manufacturing, you know, the steel industry is huge, uh, auto parts, um, then petrochemicals industry is very important. Um, so all this uh, makes it a well-diversified economy that is uh, self-sufficient to a large extent. So they don't import a lot of goods. They do have to import some essential goods, some uh, food products, some pharmaceutical products, but the majority of what they consume is actually they can produce themselves. You know, these are these are good things about you know sanctions for uh, having sanctions for a couple of decades that you don't have a choice. You need to develop all those different industries so that you, your economy can function properly. Um, uh, so 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 yes, it is it is surprising because when you look at Iraq uh, or Saudi Arabia, you know, it's more than ninety percent of GDP is coming from oil. And, and, and in Iran, those commodities, so it's not only oil and gas, it's also um, uh, metals like iron ore, uh, zinc, um, um, some other um, um, industrial metals um, as the deposit, deposits as well. Yeah. This is an additional feature to, of the Iranian economy that can help it help to kickstart the growth. Um, and help finance infrastructure investments, for example. Yeah, so this is important, but the biggest opportunity is actually in the non-oil part of the Iranian economy and in the human resources as the main resource of the, of the Iranian economy. And this is also reflected in the stock market. So what struck me, I mean, I was very surprised to learn that the stock market has 600 companies listed um, across 50 different industries. And there is no oil and gas on the stock market. So it's not a proxy on oil prices. Uh, you have, you know, petrochemicals, telecoms, uh, steel companies, pharmaceuticals, um, 
a lot of different manufacturing companies, software companies, um, consumer staples, FMCG companies. So like really like a proper, well-diversified market. And um, the market cap is around $250 billion. So um, probably, you know, one of the biggest frontier markets, if it was classified as a frontier, it would be one of the, or the biggest uh, frontier market. Uh, with proper liquidity. So the average daily liquidity last year was around um, $400 million. $400 million of trading per day uh, in Iran uh, with no foreign investors. All the foreign investors are, as I said, less than half a percent of the market cap. Uh, so it's all local money uh, driven by uh, individual retail investors. So you have you know, one to two million retail investors that invest um, probably you know, around $100 on average. And, and this makes the market very inefficient, which is very, uh, very interesting as well for professional investors. It's a bit like China A shares before hedge funds started investing there or Vietnam at an earlier stage before institutional investors got involved. Um, so, uh, so, so this was what, uh, what struck me uh, when I started learning about Iran um, um, was one thing is, you know, how well developed the country is um, then um, absolutely how I enjoyed, you know, meeting and spending time and, 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 and talking with, with, with the local people. And they are super friendly. I mean, you know, another misconception about Iran, you know, Iran, because, because of political reasons, the whole country is often portrayed as the country of, I don't know, terrorists, right? Or some dangerous place out there. And when you go to Iran, if you travel there by yourself, you see that, you know, if you go around different cities, you meet people, if they speak English, they will approach you and have a chat with you. They don't have too many tourists. So everyone is curious. Everyone is super friendly. So not only neutral, they're friendly and want to have a chat, want to get to know you. Um, it's a very, you know, tolerant society. So obviously, um, um, Iran as a country is Muslim. It's a Shia Muslim country. But you have big minorities uh, of Sunni minorities, Jewish minorities, Christian minorities. Um, I was going around, uh, you know, sightseeing different churches, was going to Jewish synagogues, uh, Zoroastrian churches, Christian churches. And everyone is doing his thing. There is no, you know, police in, in front of the church. It's, it's, it's open and, and um, you know, the, the, the society is, to is tolerant. More than that, you actually have um, permanent seats in the Iranian parliament for the Jewish minority, Christian minority, and the Zoroastrian minority, so that they are also represented in the, in the parliament. Um, all, again, um, the situation with, uh, with women. So, you know, I guess that people in the West who don't know, who don't understand Iran, probably only notice that, you know, women in Iran have to wear hijab, right? That this is compulsory to, to cover your head. But when you look deeper, um, actually the majority of students are women uh, from the top universities in Iran. Uh, when you start, <laughs> to, get, to, to get to know the local families, you understand that, you know, households and household budgets and the most important decisions, they are run by women. Uh, so they actually control, you know, the households. And um, when, I, when I work with women, when I meet with, uh, uh, meet women pro in professional jobs, working in banks and so on, they are the best educated with the best English um, doing really important jobs. So look, it's, it's with countries like Iran, it's so important. It's so, so good to go there by yourself and actually, you know, not only do your own like investment research, but get to know the country, start to understand it on the, uh, it's, it's, it's culture, uh, it's population. So, so this was, this was um, a very surprising, positively surprising thing to, to observe. And I had, and I had no bias. I mean, I had, I had never met an Iranian in my life before my first trip to Iran. I went there for the first time in 2016 when the, um, the JCPOA was signed. So the Iran nuclear deal was signed. 
the UN sanctions were lifted and it became legal for non-US people to, to invest in Iran. Um, so this is the first time I went there. I didn't have any contacts. I, I just made a couple of appointments um, via email uh, with local banks, with local brokers. And, and, I, and I was just going out and, and meeting people, meeting in the hotels, meeting in the restaurant and um, enjoyed you know, every minute of it. Um, so uh, but, but Iran is not only, you know, has the worst PR because of those misconceptions about the population, um, um, but also there is absolutely no knowledge about its local e economy and about the local uh, capital market, that the capital market exists, that there is a liquid, deep, diversified stock market uh, where you can buy the cheapest assets in the world uh, and you have no competition from foreign investors. So, so let's uh, let's transition in uh, to talk about more more about the stock market. Um, and so, I would like to talk about how the stock market has performed. But if I could ask you to talk about how has it performed in the local currency, the Iranian real, but also in dollars, and perhaps we can compare that to the global stock market or the S and P five hundred. Yes. So, I don't really check the performance in the local currency. So, the honest question is, I don't know. Because in a country where you have high inflation, the stock market will always be booming, right, in the local currency. So it doesn't matter if it went up by 1,000% or, you know, 2,000%, right? Uh, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, when you look at the stock market in local currency, they, they have some stock markets, also look good. But they are not a comparison to Iran because they don't have real functioning economies with, uh, with proper companies. So when you observe them in dollar terms, there is nothing interesting. In Iran... In dollar terms, um, so there, there's a couple of things to say here. First of all, the main index was launched in May 2008. So it has uh, 13 full years of, of historical data. And it's astonishing to, to observe that your dollar return from Iranian assets over the, those 13 years uh, was uh, more than 13% per year uh, annualized. So if you invested in Iranian equities as a foreign dollar investor back in you know, May 2008 and held it for you know, the following 13 years, you would be annualizing 13% in dollars per year. Now, S&P 500 over the same period is around, it's a bit less, it's 12 and a half percent, I think. It doesn't matter if it's a bit less or a bit more, it's similar. And S&P 500, um, you know, obviously the biggest economy in the world, the most innovative economy in the world. In the meantime, you had technology boom, you had Apple, right? You had Amazon, all the good things um, that happened there. Um, and Iran, is the country that has been under sanctions. Since 2008, it had two episodes of um, currency depreciating more than 70%. It had in US sanctions, UN sanctions. It had a populist um, president uh, in the meantime uh, who actually caused you know, the depreciation and the UN sanctions. Um, the narrative, the, um, the sentiment about Iran it's always, oh, uh, it's either sanctions or it's about to, to, to be war in the region or something like this, right? So with all those you know, t t bad things happening around Iran, the stock market still you know, outperformed S&P 500, and I mean total return here and there. Um, this is astonishing. I mean, I was surprised when I checked this. Obviously, with huge volatility, the volatility is coming from the FX because the FX is um, the asset class that reacts to all the geopolitical tensions. Um, so you had many drawdowns, like up to 40, 50 percent drawdowns. But then you had strong rallies because the, the market was we, um, uh, rallying after the, the currency drawdowns. We can we can talk about this in a moment, how it works. Um, but this was astonishing. So what happened under Trump? Um, and why is it? Well, it's obviously important because Trump imposed very strong sanctions on Iran. Um, so 
2016 was a big hope because the nuclear deal was just signed. The market had an initial quick rally of, I think, 30, 40% in dollar terms. Then it started going sideways. And then Trump won the election. And then 2018, it started imposing sanctions. 2018 was tough because this is when the currency dropped by, I think, 75% in one year. So Iranian real versus US dollar. Now, um, what that caused is that the following year, so 2019, Iranian equities in dollar ter terms pretty much doubled. And this was the best performing market in the world in dollar terms. And then the following year, so 2019, um, it also was a very strong year. So, sorry, 2020, um, 2020 uh, yeah, so 18 sanctions, 19 a uh, strong bull market that continued into 2020. So overall, from the beginning on, of 2019 to the end of 2020, the market in dollar terms tripled more or less, or even a bit more than that. Now, despite US sanctions. So how was this possible? It's because um, the majority of the stock market, um, the majority of the companies um, that are listed on the stock market are positively correlated with the US dollar. So uh, many of these companies are actually dollar assets that just happen to be listed in Tehran. So they are not only hedged, naturally hedged against the currency depreciation, but they um, actually, many of them actually benefit from the depreciation of the Iranian real. Uh, imagine you're an exporter, you know, the currency goes down. So dollar goes up by 50%, your revenues go up by 50%, but your costs, remain in, in, in real that is depreciating. So you're much more competitive, your margins are uh, increasing, um, and if your revenues are going up 50%, your earnings are going up much more because of operational leverage. So that's why we were focusing on, um, you know, we had to change our uh, strategy uh, many times. So this is not in line with what you know, maybe Buffett said that just don't overcomplicate your investment strategy. In a country like Iran, where this, the, the stock market and all the assets are strongly affected by the macroeconomic drivers, such as you know, the, the, the FX or the inflation or uh, trade disruptions and so on. Well, you, you have to have a strong understanding of macro because um, profits will be more driven by macro in those periods than by you know, the quality of the management of the company, for example. So, um, so this is what we were doing. Um, initially, we were invested in companies that would benefit from the opening up of the country. Then we switched our portfolio to focus completely on companies with the highest sensitivity of earnings to the dollar exchange rate. So exporters with the biggest, um, uh, initially, these were exporters, um, uh, with the biggest leverage, actually. So we're, uh, you know, every appreciation increase in the, in, the, in the rate of the dollar was affecting the earnings the most. Um, so, so, so these are the returns, quite astonishing over a, a, a long period of time, um, uh, well, albeit with, with a higher volatility. Then um, even, I would say, even more astonishing uh, under a period of strong sanctions, uh, which was, uh, you know, during the previous U.S. administration, where um, they they've proven the resilience, uh, which is also the resilience of a big part of the economy, which is manufacturing export driven, um, and uh, and especially uh, when you look at the companies that export in the region, so not the big exporters that sell to you know South Korea, Japan, and so on, because they got affected by sanctions and their their volumes dropped. But the, ex the regional exporters, though, I don't know, companies exporting paper to Afghanistan or to Pakistan uh, or uh, companies exporting, um, you know, food or cement to, to Iraq, uh, they were not affected by sanctions because they're trading in oil. And also the reg regional trade was much more difficult to, to stop um, uh, for the U.S. than, than the big exports um, out of the country. Um, so, um, th th these are the returns, uh, but it's also um, quite very, very interesting how 
different types of different industries, different types of companies um, were benefiting from what was going on in Iran. So initially, the exporters were the obvious choice, the obvious pick to, to focus on when the currency was depreciating. But what happened next? And we studied, you know, 15 years of the of the Iranian um, historical data of the index, where we looked at uh, different periods of um, not only stock price performance, but also of uh, corporate earnings. Oh, maybe one, one comment here. You have really good data available in Iran, not only on the macro level uh, statistical data, but on the company level. So we have access to you know, 20 years of history of uh, quarterly uh, financial data for 400 biggest companies. Um, but also the biggest companies um, have to publish monthly reports. And those monthly reports um, show you the data, uh, the sales data in a very granular way. So they have to show um, each main product category um, uh, divided into volumes and the unit prices at which they are selling. So every month uh, you have a couple of data points, a couple of thousand data points that is published where companies show product by product how the volumes are evolving and how the prices per each product are, are evolving. That's very important because especially when you have an inflationary environment that shows you which companies um, have pricing power um, or which companies get affected by trade disruptions in positive or negative way. And it also, um, it also confirms um, all the other numbers that you see because you collect monthly data, then when you receive quarterly data, well, they have to be in line with the monthly data. So they are more you know, difficult to manip manipulate. Um, and then, um, and then you know, semi-annual, annual data. So the reporting is quite strong. The regulatory requirements, reporting requirements are more strict than in Europe, most of the European markets, in my opinion. Um, so, so, so this is very helpful. So also when we want to study history, the history of, of the Iranian market and how different industries, different companies were reacting to different regimes, different phases of the cycle, let's say, we can go back, look at the share prices, which show us, okay, what happened on the market. But then we can also, uh, you know, pretty much correlate it against uh, the developments uh, with the financial data to understand, okay, so who was actually benefiting? And then we drill down, you know, dig deeper to, um, uh, to try to understand, okay, so what re actually happened that um, caused, you know, sales in this particular industry to accelerate the growth to accelerate in the period, for example, of, uh, of sanctions. And with exporters, it was pretty obvious. But then it wasn't the, um, these weren't the biggest beneficiaries. The biggest beneficiaries were actually local producers, domestic producers that were selling in the domestic market. Why? Because their comp competitors were suddenly gone. They were, first of all, priced out of the market after you know, a 70% depreciation of the currency, uh, even the Chinese companies exporting to Iran were no longer competitive. Um, but also it was just simply too difficult to export to Iran because of sanctions. So what I said at the beginning, you know, organizing logistic, uh, logistics, uh, so shipping, insurance, payments, and so on, this was either expensive or just impossible. Um, so local producers, uh, despite the economy not expanding, so economy just, you know, going sideways, um, the non-oil part of the economy was uh, was the sideways. The oil part of the economy was was uh, declining, obviously. Um, so with stagnant economy, those companies suddenly were showing big sales growth because they were gaining market share um, because the import um, imports collapsed. So import substitution actually was um, even a bigger, stronger effect um, or had a stronger impact on earnings. Uh, than than in the case of exporters, so that's 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 super you know interesting and 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 exciting when you look at Europe because you have all, all this this goes back you know to the depth and the diversity 
um, um, how well diversified is the local market. And because you have so many industries listed, you can always find something interesting happening somewhere. Um, well, pretty much like, like in the you know, major developed markets uh, on big enough scale. And on top of that, you know, market driven by individual investors. So, so let's uh, let's go back and talk a bit more about the uh, the currency. You know, it's it's interesting. Whenever you pull it up, you see these big vertical moves in the exchange rate. And I'm just, of course, it depends on which currency you're looking at. But I, I would imagine most of the developed currencies, you would see the same thing. And specifically here, I pulled it up and and compared it with the U.S. dollar, and I can see here back in September 2010, one U.S. dollar was the same uh, worth the same as 10,000 Iranian real. And then uh, since uh, August 2018, it's equivalent to around 42,000 um, Iran Real. Uh, could you talk a bit more about those vertical moves? Like, has the currency been pegged? Uh, how does the inflation, um, uh, how, how does that play into it? So it's actually more complicated than what you are seeing on the chart at the moment, because you are looking at a chart um, of the official exchange rate. And to make things more complicated, uh, there are a couple of exchange rates in Iran. There is the official that, uh, that actually no one uses. The official rate is the rate that only importers of essential goods can use. So when you're importing food or medical uh, products to Iran, you can go to the central bank, show them what you're buying, and ask them to sell you dollars at the 42,000 uh, rate. This is basically a subsidy so that um, um, Im Im imported essential goods are not too expensive for the population. They are in the process of um, changing this, reforming this, because it's a, it's a really bad policy that has um, many negative unintended consequences. I mean, mainly corruption, but also killing domestic industries. So, okay, let me first comment on those different exchange rates. Um, you have the official exchange rate. As I said, no one can trade on this. It's only for the importers of essential goods. Then you have the NIMA rate. NIMA rate, uh, NIMA is the platform where all the biggest exporters and importers are required to buy and sell hard currency. This is where the biggest liquidity is. If petrochemical companies sell, uh, or other exporters sell products abroad and they get paid, then they have to uh, sell their hard currency, well, everything that they don't need for imports uh, on this platform. So this is the biggest liquidity. And over there, $1 is around 250,000 riyal. That's a big gap, right? 42,000 and 250,000. And um, there is also a bazaar rate or market rate or black market rate. Um, it's not a black market, it's also legal, but it's only available to individuals. So when you're an individual Iranian, you want to buy a couple of thousand dollars, you go to one of the exchange houses uh, or to the bazaar actually, um, and, you can, and you can buy dollars there. And on the bazaar, um, $1 is around, right now, probably 280,000 reals. So you have 42,000 on the official rate, but you don't care about this rate. It's, uh, you, you, you cannot use this. Um, you have the NIMA rate, 250,000, and you have the market rate around 280,000. Most of the time, the spread between the market rate and the NIMA rate, uh, so the individual, let's say, and the corporate, the liquid rate, is around 10%. Sometimes it expands to 20 or, or 30% when there is some stress, when suddenly individuals go and uh, rush to buy dollars because um, there's some geo usually geopolitical tension. Sometimes it collapses to 0%, but um, the average uh, spread is around uh, 10%. Um, and, and, and this functions well. So um, the government is trying to get rid of the um, official rate because this is basically subsidy, but this subsidy is not working well because it causes corruption. So 
you know, you can you can read stories every now and then about some friends of some, you know, uh, minister or some other official person um, who got access to this rate to import iPhones, right, instead of instead of food or uh, or pharmaceuticals. Um, it also it also is just not very wise because look, if you can import food at this rate, it means that um, it's very cheap for the importers. It's very cheap to buy, for example, I don't know, Turkish uh, butter, right? Or some other food product. And what this means is that Hey everybody, it's Trey Lockerbie from the We Study Billionaires podcast here to tell you about Titan. If you're ready to invest but not really sure where to start, Titan takes all the guesswork out of investing by actively managing your money for you. With Titan, you can ride shotgun along with a team of dedicated, experienced analysts as they allocate your money for you and let you in along the way. Titan is the first investment platform for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experts. They offer three equity portfolios and America's first actively managed crypto portfolio. Since launching each portfolio, Titan has outperformed the benchmark in three of four portfolios on an after fees basis. They aim to grow your investments 15% annually, which would imply that you're doubling your wealth every five years net of fees. You'll even see exactly how your money is managed through video, audio, and written updates on their mobile app. Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you use my URL linked in the description below, titan.com slash TIP, you'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. There is no incentive to produce it locally because if you, if you, if you want to produce stuff locally, then you're, you, know, you have to use local prices, um, local, uh, you know, all the local costs. You don't get any subsidy. Um, and then, uh, so also the price of the product at which you will be able to sell to, to be profitable will also not be subsidized. It will be just a market price. And this market price will be also always higher than the subsidized price of an imported product, um, in this case, that is uh, where the official rate is used. So that's why uh, you know, I said that this rate is actually killing domestic industries, because I was looking for producers of, um, of some essential uh, food products in Iran, for example, butter, and I couldn't find any. And, and I realized that, no, it, it's actually cheaper to import it from Turkey because of the government subsidy than to produce it domestically in Iran, despite the lowest wages in the world, right? So it's, so it's just, you know, unwise. Um, they are removing it and plan to replace it with different types of subsidies, like direct cash handouts to the poorest, um, you, know, you know, segment of the population. Which, which definitely makes, makes more sense. Um, so, so these are, so now going back to those different exchange rates and the chart. So you saw some pretty drastic moves, but then again, you're only looking at the official uh, chart where the drastic moves end at 42,000. The, 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 the real rate is 250,000 or 280,000. So those drastic moves were even, were even stronger. And the currency, as I said, is the asset that is the most sensitive to uh, geopolitical pressure. So whenever you had, um, um, for example, over the previous four years, five years, it were mainly sanctions. So sanctions being imposed uh, by, um, by the previous US administration, it was the currency that was reacting. Um, also, because of, uh, because of lower oil sales, so again, sanctions affected oil exports, with lower oil sales, uh, Iranian uh, government is running budget deficit um, that is much higher than it used to be when the oil sales were at you know two million uh, barrels per day um, exports. Um, so uh, they have to print money. Basically, they try to raise taxes or maybe collect taxes more efficiently. So they are trying all the good things to to make the system work more efficiently but they're also printing more money. And this increases inflation, which um, obviously um, um, decreases the, the, the real value of, of real, so the currency is dropping. Um, so uh, 
Yeah, so 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 this um, uh -huh, and going back to to inflation, you asked about you know the the monetary policy. The, there is no there is no official interest rate set by the central bank in Iran, as you know you have the Fed funds rate or um, um, interest rates policies in in in, in developed countries. They um, try to control inflation uh, mainly by limiting the interest rates that commercial banks uh, can offer on their deposits or charge on their loans. So they're targeting directly the rates at the commercial banks. Um, but also uh, they try to intervene on the currency market up to a certain level uh, because this is well, this is limited by the, by the size of the reserves. So because the majority of the inflation um, is coming from, you know, it's driven by FX. They're trying to affect, affect the, the FX market uh, to, to stabilize inflation. Uh, not very successful when you're under sanctions, when you don't have, um, you know, reserves coming from um, oil exports. Uh, that's why inflation has been running high, you know, since 2019. Uh, but it's important to, to note that before the, the sanctions of the previous U.S. administration, inflation in Iran was in single digit. It was around eight, nine percent, you know, ten percent, let's say, for a quite long period of time, and then it went moved up, you know, to fifty percent or whatever because of sanctions. And there is no reason why it shouldn't go back to where it was, let's say, around um, uh, ten percent. Um, so. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, don't remember if there was a second part to the question. No, no, I, I, uh, I think we're uh, we're good, much here. Uh, and thank you for your elaborate uh, responses to that. And I also understand that. I mean, these are not. This might sound like a simple question, but uh, here in life, uh, it's typically very, very hard to uh, to respond to to questions about finance and you know those. 30 seconds clips you, uh, you're supposed to do on, on different channels. Um, whenever I hear about an investment opportunity like Iran, uh, the upside itself is, is really selling itself. And this is a, a type of investment uh, that's been on our radar for quite some time. I think it was back in 2017, 2018, we had Raul Paul t coming on the show and talking about investing in Iran. And he talked about how attractive it was, also how difficult it was to get access in the first place. But because of how many tailwinds you simply get from all the, the low valuations. And um, if I can then make a, a, make a segue into talk about Warren Buffett, which is an investor we really followed a lot here on the show. He made this $500 million investment in PetroChina back in uh, 2003. And at the time, the company was producing 2.5% of the world's oil. So you have revenue that's priced in USD, um, a lot of the cost, not all cost, uh, there was in local Chinese currency. It was trading at a very low multiple and a 45% payout ratio. So what Warren Buffett has said afterwards was that the downside risk was just so low because of this high payout ratio. I mean, you can only pay um, dividends out of actual cash. You can't do it on accounting numbers uh, of whatnot. So... He, he felt that the downside protection was really, really high because he would recoup such a high part of the initial investment just from dividends. And then, of course, he would still have the upside. Um, do we have any kind of similar scenarios uh, happening in Iran for, for some of the local companies? Stig, I think we should have... This is the most exciting part about Iran. So I, I guess we should have talked about it earlier. I mean, you know, after I've seen the country... I got interested in the people in the top down, like macro view in the potential and so on. Everything looked really great, but the single most important factor that made me go there, you know, quit my job, set up a fund that will invest in Iran and so on, were the valuations. Uh, and the valuations, you know, they're not only cheapest in the liquid world, let's say, they, um, they are like once in a in a in a generation, I think potentially. You know, uh, look, we are buying, for example, fertilizer producers. At uh, well, last time we we did an estimate, it looks like three point two times uh, uh, forward net earnings. By forward, I mean next twelve months uh, of a company that is producing fertilizers 
has access to you know gas and is just enjoying the situation in Europe where the fertilizer plants are being shut down because of the you know natural gas crisis and price hikes and not enough supply and so on. Um, we you know the the first company that I bought was uh, you know a, a utility uh, company that was uh, um, supplying chemical gases and sweet water to petrochemical plants and it had a monopoly position in the region where it was located. It was um, valued at four and a half times um, PE, paying 20% dividend yield, and all their contracts were priced in euros. So it was hedged against the currency depreciation. Oh, the, the petrochemical, the fertilizer producer that I mentioned, um, also exports a big part of their production. So they are enjoying strong global prices in US dollars. And um, when you look at the whole market, uh, it's, let's say you have 600 companies, but we actually get consensus estimates for around 100 top companies. By top companies, I mean, you know, the biggest and the, the most covered by local analysts. So when I look at forward uh, P, it's around 4 and 4.8 at the moment for the whole market. I mean, not the, for the top 100 companies, which means that you are able to find companies that four times earnings, it's three times earnings. Now, the average expected dividend yield 12 months from now, uh, again, for those 100 companies is, ar is around 12%. The average, you have many companies, for example, we have one uh, pharmaceutical company in our portfolio um, that, is, uh, <laughs> that is priced at four times earnings. And it's well, we think it will pay, uh, the dividend yield will be around 21%. 21% from a stable pharmaceutical business, nothing to do with any sanctions, um, easy to buy liquid uh, listed in Tehran. Um, those, type of those type of opportunities. And this is the reason why, you know, the market has been, the index has been performing so well, despite like the really bad macro, despite the really negative, pessimistic uh, scenario that was playing out for Iran over the last you know decade or thirty years of the index, um, and um, um, you know you look at uh, we have a cement company, not because we are very bullish on cement. There's actually oversupply in many parts of Iran, but it's a but it's a but it's a regional product. It's difficult to export it. But they are located on the border with Iraq and have an Iraqi subsidiary and whatever building products you, you sell in Iraq, you know, everything gets sold at strong prices and they are getting dollars for it. Uh, and and again, you know, it's between four and five times uh, earnings. Um, the you, you know even software companies that we have uh, that are available on the market are probably at eight times earnings and they're growing uh, ob obviously um, high margins and so on so um, the market is very cheap and it will uh, and, and and there are reasons for it um the main reason wait one thing is that um, um interest rates are uh, quite high they're at around 20 percent so the competition from deposits is high but still, if you have, you know, if you were to make an investment decision and you can, uh, you have an inflationary economy, you can put your money in a deposit at 20% or you can put money into companies that pay, you know, between 10 and 20 or 15 and 20% dividend yield and their earnings are actually growing and they're hedged against the currency depreciation and inflation. And then obviously you would be buying stocks, but 90% uh, of the trading in Iran is, coming from individual investors so it takes time it takes time for them to realize they usually i mean usually always there was an interesting survey in iran uh, among individual investors that asked local investors how do you make investment decisions right so um the the most popular answer was um that they ask a friend um they uh, look for advice on social media and then that it was a random choice. That's it, right? Uh, but it's probably not surprising, but but this just, you know, shows you, right? Uh, it has good and bad 
outcomes for for other investors. Very good out, you know, very good thing about it is that the market is inefficient. So you can find undervalued assets, especially when you look at different types of instruments. Sometimes, you know, companies issue share rights and those rights, uh, because you have to hold them for a two, three months because before they get converted into ordinary shares that you that, that, that then you can sell on the market. You know, no one wants to buy them because it's a very long time horizon, you know, two to three months for the individual investor. So so we can buy them at, at strong discounts, like 30% discount to the underlying share price, right? So if, if you have a company, uh, you know, we were buying one of the, uh, uh, one of the commodity producers, the company itself was trading at uh, five times earnings and we were buying rights, um, share rights, um at at that time i think it was 30 percent discount um uh, to to the underlying share so we were effectively buying at you know less than four times three and a half time uh, times earnings um so those type of situations um are also possible on top of the already very attractive very low price um uh, market another reason is that for for low valuations is that there is no not enough investment capital in Iran. Not only foreign capital, but also local capital. There are many, many um, wealthy Iranians. But the traditional asset class for them is real estate. One third of Iranians invest in real estate. Cash, there are no mortgages. Just, you know, if you have any cash, you put it into a flat, right? Or into some land. Uh, then it's probably gold. Then cars because it's difficult to import cars. So used cars is actually an asset class that uh, holds its, its wow. dollar value, right? So you can hedge, people hedge uh, the currency exposure to sustain their you know, real spending power by buying cars when the dollar goes up. Um, so, so but, but stock market is just more complicated. So, so, so let, me, uh, let me ask you, uh, Maji, so, we have this investment thesis that as the market is opening up, a lot of money flows into uh, the country that, that pushes up the equity values to quote unquote intrinsic value. Um, but is there also a flip side? Is it so that uh, if, if the country is truly opening up that the Iranian companies will not be able to compete in a free and more global market? Absolutely. There are companies that will suffer from uh suddenly facing professional competitors so you already have in iran on a small scale companies like uh nestle uh like unilever um you know some big tobacco companies uh, so really really big multinational companies that would like to increase their presence they cannot right now because you know the country is under sanctions they already have some operations. They are allowed to keep them, but they cannot uh, increase the the scale of their operations. But they will. They will. You know, I know many companies. I speak to many companies, multinational companies. They are that are present in Iran. They are all thinking about expanding as soon as they are allowed to. I hear about big companies or even sovereign wealth funds that have a list of. Uh, you know, big investments that they want to do in Iran, they're just waiting for the green light, you know, from the White House. So, so, so it will be happening. And in some of those industries, the local companies uh, will, uh, will suddenly face a different reality, right? Because before, with no foreign competitors, you know, sometimes you see, you know, a lazy management of a company, but it's just, you know, its products are selling themselves, right? This will not be possible. Uh, same, it's the same for some exporters, um, where some management managements are just you know the quality of these people is just it's just terrible. Uh, some of them are very impressive, but some of them are terrible, and they are still you know increasing profits every year thanks to the currency depreciation, right? Because it helps them to uh, stay competitive, right? And and they will have to they will have to improve uh, operations and the quality of management um, in the future. But on the flip side, there are many companies that are just obvious takeover targets. I mean, look for example, we're looking at 
one investment holding. Um, this is a thing in Iran. You have investment holdings. So um, banks, for example, banks love or used to love. Now the regulator is just actually pushing them to sell non-core assets, but they used to love acquiring different assets that were had nothing to do with banking. So mines of you know zinc or um, some some companies. So and they are building this those those holdings investment holdings that have assets. And very often there are multiple layers of investment holdings. So we have a big investment holding that holds another investment holding that holds and some you know assets um, that are interesting. And for example, we're looking at one investment holding that holds companies um, that produce cleaning products and personal hygiene products, soap, washing powder, uh, those type of things. And they these companies together, they, they have around 20% uh, of the market share of a market that is, you know, 84 million people plus the export markets in the region. And, um, and these are brands that have been around for 50 or 60 years, uh, non-cyclical, um, strong distribution across the whole market, sometimes in the region as well. And they, um, uh, portfolio of different uh, different product types and different brands valued at around let's say five five, five earnings, five earnings. Um, um, because you have you have additional discounts if you buy the whole investment holding because the holding itself is listed but it's uh, but it's listed below its NAV because there are some you know additional costs on the holding levels many managements many um, um, you know inefficiencies that you could easily get rid of so five six times earnings that you have to pay for the whole thing you understand that the the real earnings that this can produce are twice as high so you're actually buying it three times earnings but the most important thing for a big multinational company would be that you get to acquire a very strong brand and distribution network across the whole country um for you know the size of the investment. I mean, the whole market cap would be around probably around hundred million dollars, right? So it's so it's nothing. So it's not um, um, a serious investment for a big company, and and it gives you a great uh, you know foothold in a, in a in a big country where the spending power of consumers will be will be going up. So those are the companies that will obviously benefit, and they, they, I'm, I'm I'm sure they 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 will be taken over. So you have different companies. Some of them will. They obviously uh, face competition, but some of them uh, uh, will be taken over. But many, many other companies, and this is the main point of the of the investment thesis, you know, that this country will start growing fast. It has everything it needs in terms of, you know, to realize this potential. Quality people, um, companies that have already gained scale big enough to to be able to uh, to operate under sanctions because of the big domestic market the market that you know the country that missed everything good that happened in emerging markets over the last three decades so they will experience all of this inflow of capital um interest rates going down um access to financing um transaction costs going massively down this is the main point of the investment thesis. And then on top of that, you know, because you can actually Google interviews with one of the biggest um, passive asset managers in the world, where they say that Iran is probably the most exciting um, market for the next decade. But these are usually American institutions, right? So they cannot invest right now and they'll have to wait until they can invest a, a bit longer. What we can do and what all the non-US investors can do is actually front run those guys, right? And take advantage of these low valuations. And even if you ha have to wait for the big opening up when finally the US investors um, are, are allowed to invest as well. In the meantime, you see that um, uh, those companies are growing and this growth should only accelerate with the opening up the, of, the, uh, of the market. So this is the main thing that, you know, I find that the most attractive in Iran. So, uh... We used to to think of the major major players in geopolitics, uh, China, the U.S., and 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 Europe, 
Um, however, for Iran, we have many more players than that. If you really dig into the political situation, so uh, could you add? Could I ask you to elaborate a bit more on that? And because uh, we also uh, have a new president now, um, Ibrahim Raisi uh, in Iran, uh, who are now succeeding the former president Hassan uh, Rouhani. So, so what implication would that have for our investment thesis uh, as investors? Yes, so new president versus old president, no change. Absolutely no change. There was change in rhetoric because the new guys uh, are calling themselves conservatives and the, and the previous ones were calling themselves um, reformers. But to be honest, it's the same establishment. Look, it's it's not democracy, right? It's, it's, it's the same establishment with maybe different uh, factions, but the main political decisions are still being made by the supreme leader and his council the government is more about executing those ideas not about making its own policies um so um no change or actually from what i see in terms of economic policies um what the new government is talking about is actually what the previous government should be talking about. So the big reform to subsidies, for example, this is very important and should have happened a long time ago. Uh, and it's uh, and it's actually I think it will happen soon. And uh, and it will be the conservative government that will be paradoxically uh, implementing this. So in terms of domestic politics, no real change, specifically and importantly. <clears throat> no change in terms of um, the the plan to uh, you know sign a new nuclear deal with with the West uh, and and change these relations. Um, now, the region is fascinating. Um, you have the big superpower, which is the U.S., that is actually removing itself from the region. So Afghanistan is a is the obvious example, but they would. I think the Biden administration would also very much like to, you know, tick Iran as also, you know, something, one problem that was solved. Um, US is removing itself from the region uh, because, and it's also, I guess, obvious, they no, no longer need to import uh, that much energy as they used to. So the US is self-sufficient. I mean, they still need to import because they, they produce you know, the stuff that they can export, but they need to import some other um, uh, you know, products, um, uh, oil products. But on a net basis, in aggregate numbers, they are self-sufficient. So they don't care that much anymore, um, brutally speaking. And it's probably would be more and more difficult politically to justify, you know, sending american young american soldiers you know somewhere to the region that is not actually that important for the security of the country even energy security anymore however who should care is europe and china because these are big countries big regions that um the need to secure um long-term supplies of energy china understands this europe not really i think they are well, beginning to understand right now. So China understands, and they are speaking to everyone in the Middle East, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, Qatar, to secure long-term contracts uh, for oil and natural gas. Uh, and this is uh, super important for the Chinese economy. Also, uh, in case of Iran, they China has a strong negotiating power because this is the only country that keeps on importing um, Iranian oil despite U.S. sanctions. They're not doing this directly, but but indirectly through you know, Malaysia or uh, different tankers, whatever. Um, and um, they're also, uh, I think they also started paying in different currencies than the U.S. dollar. Uh, China would love to pay in, in the Chinese yuan uh, because then they would no longer be uh, uh, relying so much on the U.S. dollar. So it's uh, very important for the security um, of the Chinese uh, you know, economy. Uh, for Iran, you know, getting yuan is not great because there is nothing you can do with yuan, but they can buy Chinese products with those yuan. Uh, so 
um, I don't know the exact you know mix of the currencies, but uh, they are definitely doing this in many different currencies. Um, so China is very important. Um, uh, Russia is uh, is important. Um, they they have big presence in Syria, where also Iran had a big presence in Syria. They were both cooperating uh, with Assad, uh, so they were also cooperating with each other. Uh, with with uh, Russia was also uh, is helping Iran uh, with some exports, where Russia basically can buy Iranian oil and use Iranian oil and sell more of its own Russian oil uh, to the to the to the global markets. Uh, but this seems to be uh, more like a um, convenient co the cooperation because it's because it's convenient. So out of convenience, marriage out of convenience, then a strong long term partnership with China. It makes much more sense because their interests are aligned. Uh, they have signed a long term, like twenty five year uh, cooperation, um, you know, partnership program, where China said that they would invest around four hundred billion dollars over twenty five years, but much of this uh, front loaded, four hundred billion dollars. Iran's GDP is around two hundred billion dollars. Well, depending which exchange rate you use, right? But let's say it's around. Uh, and from which moment? <laughs> um, uh, but let's say it's around two hundred billion dollars. So it's twice, you know, the size of this investment is twice as much as Iran's GDP. Uh, so it would be, you know, uh, uh, more than Marshall Plan for for Europe after war, or more than um, EU funds for the Eastern European countries that access the EU. Um, yeah, in 2004. So um, yeah, it's it's a big, big injection of investment into the Iranian economy. And it's going where it should be, which is the infrastructure. Iran needs infra infrastructure spending. And because the level of investment for now is so low, everything you invest is very productive. It's like, you know, Chinese investing in their own infrastructure 20 years ago. So it makes economic sense. And uh, Chinese want to spend uh, mainly on um, oil and gas production because then Chinese are getting paid in the discounts in oil. Yeah, like big discounts, 30% discounts in oil price that they will import over the next you know, two, three decades uh, from Iran. Mm, uh, for Iran, it's a great deal. I mean, you know, Chinese will come and um, help uh, build uh, the, the, the oil production infrastructure ports, uh, airports, highways, you know, all the vital infrastructure. And Iran gets to sell, you know, oil at 30% discount. Otherwise, this oil would be stuck underground. I mean, so it's a, so it's a really, really good trade um, for Iran, but also for, for China. Then China also gets closer to Iran, which is on their um, Belt and Road Initiative. And it's one of the most important countries. I mean, it's, it's, it's through which, you know, all the freight, all those trains will be going to, to Europe. Already, I think uh, three years ago, they opened a train connection between Tehran and, um, and, and Xi'an, I think, uh, in, in China, which cuts significantly the time of uh, shipping this uh, uh, via sea routes. Um, so, so, so China, absolutely, I think the most um, important player there. But there are also regional relations. So traditionally, historically, um, Muslim countries, Sunni Muslim countries and Shia Muslim countries are competing with each other. And uh, there is some rivalry. So Saudi Arabia uh, versus Iran, mainly for many years, uh, those relations have been, have been quite rough. But they started, oh, and they, this was also amplified by divisive policies of the previous US administration, which was actually, you know, putting those countries against, against each other. Um, what has been happening over the last year, year and a half, is, is, is quite profound because all of these countries started talking to each other. Now, Iran with Saudi Arabia are discussing re-establishing diplomatic uh, relations. Um, 
Uh, then Turkey is involved as well. Turkey, which has been, you know, an ally of Qatar, and Qatar also had its issues with the U UAE and Saudi Arabia. Uh, but what happened is that the Saudi Arabia and UAE unblocked Qatar, uh, talking to, to Turkey. Um, um, Israel speaking with uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia quite close right now. So suddenly, most of these countries are uh, are speaking to each other and understanding that you know they will be neighbors forever. So they have to actually take care of the security of the region and uh, you know the stability of the region because it's in everyone's interest. There is no appetite for a military conflict uh, from any country in the region. So I would say that the last uh, relation that is still, you know, quite tense is between Israel and Iran, uh, where, again, important to emphasize, it's not between the population of Israel and population of Iran, because this has nothing to do with religion. I mean, the, the biggest Jewish diaspora in the region outside of Israel is in Iran. People have, don't know about this, right? And so it's it, between the governments, obviously. Um, and but I think that, and you can read more and more often in uh, Israeli newspapers that they also think that um, a good nuclear agreement that would basically eliminate the chance of um, Iran building nuclear weapons anytime soon or ideally, you know, anytime in the future. Um, uh, that this would be, uh, you know, the best thing to uh, to have the security in the region that Israel needs. All right. So, uh, Machi, we, we covered a lot of ground here um, during this interview. We talked about the stock market, a lot about the political situation and, and everything in between. Uh, this has been, I've learned so much from, from this interview, and I'm sure uh, our listeners feel the same way. Uh, where can the audience learn more about you, but also about uh, Amsterdam Capital? Yeah, so, you know, please, uh, if you would like to chat about Iran, uh, talk about investing in Iran, we obviously know a lot about this. We've been focused on Iran since 2000, uh, late 2016. We launched our first fund in 2017. Um, so please go to our website and just send us an email, and I'm happy to reply. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, where I uh, try to to, to publish um, from time to time uh, some interesting updates, uh, but definitely get in touch uh, via email, um, and I'm happy to put you on our distribution list. Uh, we we do quarterly updates that we send out to everyone who is interested. Uh, so please do get in touch. Fantastic. So and we will make sure to link to all of that in the show notes. Uh, but uh, Maciej, thank you so much for for the time uh, you spent with us here today. Um, it's been it's been fantastic. Great, thank you so much, Sik, for having me. It was it was really good fun. Thank you. All right, perfect. All right, guys, that was all that we have for this week's episode of the Investors Podcast. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, or if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button just below the video. All right, that's all we had, and we'll see each other again next week. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 